Well, good morning, and welcome to the 11 o'clock worship service at Nutrioso Bible Church. Good to see you, Gail. Glad you're here. Long time no see. Also welcome to May 16th, the Sunday after Mother's Day. And I won't test you on what we talked about on Mother's Day last week, because I know you already remember that Anna Jarvis was responsible for founding Mother's Day. Bruce is shaking his head. I could have called on Bruce, and uh, he would have gotten it right. Let's take our bulletins, uh, flip them over to the back page where we always have our church bulletin board, and um, those are the standard announcements. We've been having a great Bible study like we did this morning, all in. Um, We had uh, 16 people in Sunday school this morning in our Bible study, and we've been averaging the next one down, our Tuesday Bible study, we've been averaging 14 on Tuesdays at 2 o'clock. You can also come at 1 and sit in the sanctuary and pray or think or just relax until 2 o'clock. And uh, certainly not the least of our announcements is this coming Saturday, the 22nd, will be our very first men's fellowship breakfast in, goodness, well over a year. So uh, men, bring an appetite. Uh, The doors open at 7. We'll start to graze about 7.30. And uh, the pastor has a closely guarded secret inspirational movie that we're going to watch. So you won't want to miss that. Gary Cressy is uh, making his famous 100-mile sausage gravy. And uh, Bubba's, where's Bubba at? There you are. Bubba's already exercising his fingers and arms so that he can help me get in there and sling biscuits and and get everything done. Right, Bubba? Bubba says yes. Okay. So (laughs) plan on joining us. Uh, A few other announcements. um, And I got this right this time. Have it right side up. If I was to hold that up, what would you think? This is fill in the blank. What does that signify? <laughs> well, that yeah, that signifies correctness. Uh, this the last Sunday of the month, fifth Sunday missions. There's four four months in the year. Yep, uh, but these four months were uh, this this one is for Sam and Kelsey Richardson, who minister at NAU to about. How many thousand students are at NAU? 12,000, something like 16, 18,000. Anyway, it's a huge mission field, huge. And um, they're doing uh, all kinds of activities up there. Uh, I talked to Sam just briefly a month ago, just for a minute or two, and they were in the car headed for a a game, a, a baseball game that they were sponsoring for these uh, college students. Keep them in your prayer. We already have Fifth Sunday Missions offerings coming in. That's great. That is absolutely great. And uh, while I'm talking about offerings, I just want to thank everybody for their tithes and offerings that keep this church running. That's a huge thank you. We we are in uh, good shape And people have been thankful. So thank you very much. Also, let's see. I'm going to hand this to Deb. Because I think you have an announcement, according to Mary you do, about Living Hope. We still have bottles up front. You can take one and sign in that you're taking a bottle. And we still um, are looking for volunteers four hours a week to work at the clinic in Springerville. They need a lot of help. So think about that one. And also they have stuff for men to do, um, a couple of projects that they wanted done if anyone was interested. And I think that the baby bottle drive goes through Father's Day. Yep, Father's Day. So if you need baby bottles, we have some. Uh, Any other announcements before we move on to prayer requests and praise? And we'll move on. Uh, 
I made some notes here earlier. Um, I haven't talked to Ed Davis now for about a week. I talked to him after last Sunday. And uh, still covets our prayers for his heart condition that they're working on. Um, it's better. It's not, wor- it's not by a long shot where it should be. And he's been in and out of that Tucson VA hospital so many times he's got his name, Ed Davis, stenciled on a parking block out there. Lift him up, please. We love him and uh, know that God will resolve this, but God needs to hear from us. So um, please remember Ed Davis, also Phyllis Oppel, is looking at more work on her foot. And they would normally be here by now. They'd probably be sitting right in front of Jody and Mike. But uh, they have a grandson graduating from high school real quick. So they're going to attend the graduation, then they'll be here, probably uh, just in um, a week or so. Also, please keep Jeremy and Rachel Trujillo in your um, prayers. Uh, Her chemo treatment affects her stomach, and there's a lot of vomiting and sickness that goes with that, so she's not able to become fully invested in she needs our prayers, and the housing situation has not changed. So pray for housing, reasonably affordable housing for, for them. Um, also, pray for the financial support of our missionaries. The Elliots and the Reclots are still down on their uh, monthly support. And there's a lot of our family traveling today, or sick, and please lift up our family to the Lord for uh, safety and healing. Uh, Linda Martin's brother, Tom, the one that lives down in the valley, is a firefighter, and he is still well under the weather, not feeling right, Uh, a lot of swelling. Uh, He's had tests that are inconclusive. He'd been on crutches for a while. Is he still on crutches? Off and on. And uh, his name is Tom, and we would... We certainly want to continue praying for him. Uh, Charles and Mary's daughter-in-law, Monica, uh, as you know, she just had cancer surgery to remove some serious cancer. And the cancer has spread outside of the surgical area. But there's sort of a, I won't call it a silver lining, but a praise in there. Mary said that this cancer that has spread outside the surgical area is one of the easiest cancers to treat and resolve. So that's, that may start tomorrow, possibly. Okay. So li- lift Monica Blair up, if you would, please. Any further prayer requests or praises? Pastor? I do now. Okay. Um, again, I've been asking for prayers for a dear friend of ours, Jackie Alamedine. Jackie, they cannot locate where the specific cancer is originating, so they are doing everything they can to find that, but she has been accepted at MD Anderson Hospital in Houston, so that's a good thing. That's a good cancer center. So prayers for them. Uh, Jenny. Uh, the Blickenstaffs would like to request prayers for family support. Okay. And um, I would also like to ask for prayer for Mark. He's working an overhaul at the plant, and he's been doing a lot of overtime since March. And it looks like they've extended through the first week in June. So he's just getting tired. If you just sure. pray that he'd have the strength and energy not to make a mistake and get yes. electrocuted. <laughs> yeah. No, and that's a big deal. I mean, when you become fatigued, uh, and just worn out, uh, safety is an issue. My my son and grandsons were just up here turkey hunting. They left this morning. And my son is a Phoenix police detective. He works in child crimes. And prior to them coming up here, he just worked a 40-hour shift. Mm. Uh, arresting the bad guys and interviewing the child victims. 
And when you work 40 hours, and I can attest to this because I was a police officer, your officer safety skills go right down the drain because you don't perceive the threat in time. Right, Mike? Yep. So, uh, yes, that's it. Yes. Here, let me, ha let me hand you the mic. You got it? Stacy will give you a mic. Give you a mic, Mike. <laughs> uh, we got a praise for our niece. Uh huh. She spent 70, 70 days in the NICU, and she's finally home. Oh, so that first is, time coming home. That's, so. that's goosebump stuff. You bet. Thanks for sharing that. Okay. Any? Oh, Deb's got one. Pray for Pam Bo. She's spending the month of May with her folks in. Minnesota. They're both in their 80s and they're having some health issues. Okay. Are they still living in Oregon? Yes. yes. Okay. Any other praises or prayer requests before we... Oh, Kathy? Um, I want to praise God for how awesome he is and for his love and his grace and provision. And um, I have an appointment tomorrow with a cardiologist down in the valley, so... I'm excited about that. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. So, traveling mercies. Okay. Any others? Okay, Brother Bob's going to lead us in prayer. Okay, if you all just follow along with me, we'll just go before the Lord now and He's heard all these prayer requests and especially the praises. And um, just follow in your hearts and add what you will to. Uh, I won't be voicing each one separately, but we'll just lift them all up this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, we can come before you this morning. We come in the name of our Lord Jesus and only because of him, which gives us great privilege, Lord, great privilege. We have uh, tremendous faith in uh, coming before you for the answers uh, to these prayer requests. And, as, and we thank you and just lift you up for who you are and what you've done for us. We lift up also our service coming this morning and our pastor as he brings us the word. We pray that our songs and those things of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight this morning. Lord, and we just, uh, we just ask you to bless us as we bless you in this service. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Will everyone please stand and join us in worshiping our Savior together, seeking Him in all that we do, every day, every hour. Amen. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His right. And all these things shall be added unto you.
to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken and Lord God great are you Lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you holy oh we pour out our praise you give life you are love you bring life to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great are you Lord in your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you holy Lord. that's right oh we worship you Lord your holy name and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you Lord and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you Lord? That's right now, sing it out. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will say, Praise. Are you Lord? It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. Oh, we give you our breath, Lord God. Ooh, you're our Lord. Oh, our King, our Redeemer, Deliverer. Oh, yes, Lord God. You're our Savior. Oh, yes, Lord God. You may be seated at this time as we continue in worship. Who am I that the highest King would welcome? I was lost, but he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, he's free indeed, I'm a child of God, yes, I At 
last he has ransomed me, his grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me, who the Son sets free. Oh, his free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Not forsaken, I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free. Oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house. There's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Praise you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Today we're going to read uh, from Matthew 16, 13 through 16. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Gail, it is so good to see you back. It's so good to be back. We have missed you. Gail has a home down in Tucson, and so she spends part of her time down here, but she's back where she belongs. <laughs> I'd like you to consider something that I was telling the Bible study class earlier this morning. I was at a seminar in California. It was a well-renowned uh, Christian author by the name of Lewis Smead. We were at um, a seminary, and there were students there, there were professors, there were a lot of people there, and I'd say 100 to 200. And there came a time when people were asked if there was something in their heart and mind after Lewis spoke that they'd like to maybe have help with. And this very, very, he was an impressive looking man, tall, uh, well put together. And he wept like a baby. And he said, I have been 
I thought a Christian for years. And I have come to this seminary and I have almost straight A's in all of my courses. And he said, I've been actively involved in the church and in work for the Lord for years. And he says, I can do it all. I can tell you about it all. But he wept. He said, I don't know Jesus. I don't know Jesus. He could tell you any truth about the Bible probably pretty well. And he could do all of the things and go through all of the motions. And yet he realized that this man, Jesus, he really didn't know. And you say, well, Tom, that's just one of those unique situations. I'm going to tell you, I don't think it is because over the years I've talked to too many people who have said, I've been in church all of my life and yet I really don't know Jesus. I don't know the person. And that to me is a tragedy because I believe if we went back to the days of Jesus, his teaching was important. Please don't anybody walk out of here and say, Tom doesn't think doctrine and teaching is important. It is. The words of Jesus are so important. But what I think really drew people to Jesus initially was the man. The individual, there was just something about him that you wanted to draw close to and be a part of and follow him anywhere. And so I'd like you to join with me on a journey. And I'd like you to do what Nathaniel was asked to do. If you go back to John, the first chapter, verse 43, this is where the invitation comes from. John 1.43 where Philip had a conversation with a dear friend of his, Nathaniel, And Philip had already found out about Jesus. And Nathaniel was really skeptical. And listen to these words, and here's where I'd like us to go. In John 1.43, the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. And he found Philip and said to him, come, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. Philip went to look for Nathanael and told them, we have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus. He's the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth, explained Nathanael. Can anything good come from Nazareth? And this is where I want you to really focus in personally. The words, come and see for yourself, he replied. That's exactly what I want us to do. Over the course of the next few weeks, I'd like to take a look and follow Jesus and see for ourselves. I want us to hear the words that Jesus spoke to people. I want to see him interact with people. I want to get a feel for who this Jesus really was and why people were drawn so close to him. And where I really want this to go is to a passage that Linda read a second ago. In Matthew, the 16th chapter, verse 15. I want you to begin to think about this question that Jesus asked some of the disciples who are closest to him, because it is so important to us. In Matthew 16, 15, it's not who do other people say that I am, but I want us to be able to answer with total conviction and love and drawn close to the heart, who do you say that I am? Because this is what's so important. It's not what other people say about Jesus, but who do you say that I am? And so on this journey, I'd like to start with one of the earliest events in Jesus' life. And I'm not going to get into all of the doctrinal implications of this, but I want to look at the man Jesus as he goes to a wedding. Now, I'm going to apologize to my folks in the back. I forgot to send them this passage. So you at home, 
you're going to have to look this up in your own Bible, and those of you who are here are not going to be able to rely on that screen. I'd like you to turn to John, the second chapter, and let's look at verse 1. And let's follow Jesus and his disciples to a wedding feast and see what we can learn about this man, Jesus. In John, the second chapter, verse 1, early on in Jesus' ministry, it says, On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples also got an invitation to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, being Jesus, they've got no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me, Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. Do your math, folks. That's 120 to 180 gallons of water. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and so they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, now draw some out of it to take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. And he did not realize where it had come from. Though the, disciple, though the servants who had drawn, drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom and aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first. Then they get the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best until now. Again, looking at this passage, What can we learn about this man, Jesus? Well, first of all, let's talk about Jewish weddings, if we could. Jewish weddings are totally different than our weddings today. So if you've been to a lot of weddings, you really don't know what was going on in the time of Jesus. The first thing we know about Jewish weddings, if you were a virgin, this was your first marriage, You had to get married on a specific day of the week. Do you know what that day was? Wednesday. The ceremony had to start on Wednesday if you were a virgin. And when you got married, when you went before the ceremony, there would be a great feast. A great feast. And after the feast, you'd get together and you'd do your vows. And after the vows were done your friends would put a canopy over you, held over the husband and wife, and they would lead you back to your home. And it would be at night, so the torches were all lit, and you would begin weaving throughout the streets. And they always took the longest possible route. Why? Because everybody in the community wanted to wish you well. There would be merriment, and there would be joy, And when you got to the house, because they didn't take honeymoons out of town, they didn't go to Mexico or someplace like that, they went to their home for the next week. They would party. They would celebrate. The bride, the groom, they wore crowns. And they were addressed as king and queen. And for a full week, when they walked around, People would address them as king and queen. This was the most important event in the life of a man and woman if you were Jewish. This was what started you out as a couple, and it set the tone for how you would relate to your community. Because you weren't individuals, you were part of a larger family, a part of the community. Now, in the Jewish way of looking at things, there was a lot of honor and shame that went with it. You lived up to a certain standard, you were honored. You broke that standard, what happened? You lived with shame, and not just for a little while, they didn't forget. And so in the midst of this great wedding ceremony, something tragic took place, because again, 
this ceremony to where people were coming in and eating and drinking for a long period of time, this lasted for a week. And in the Middle Eastern way of looking at things, you were supposed to be a good host, which meant you had plenty of food and plenty of drink for everybody. And here's where it went wrong. Jesus and his disciples are there, and their mother, there's speculation that maybe she helped plan this. I don't know. But she was aware that suddenly this couple had a real problem. They're running out of wine, and we have days yet to go. They have a problem because they can't say, party's over, everybody go home, sorry we didn't plan this right. You have to have more than enough to get you all the way through. And if you don't, your honor has just done what? Turn to shame. And your wedding, instead of being the highest point of your life, will become the absolute lowest point because for years to come, what people will remember was you were the couple that didn't have enough wine to be hospitable to everybody. And so Mary goes to Jesus and says, we have a problem. There's not enough wine. Now, to understand the importance of this, wine was an important part of every Jewish celebration. In fact, the rabbis used to say, where there is no wine, there is no joy. You couldn't substitute other things. Now somebody might say, Tom, are you telling me that the rabbis and God talk about drunkenness, that they were thrown a one-week drunken carousal? Absolutely not, because drunkenness in the Jewish way of doing things was a shame. It was a disgrace. They didn't drink just to get drunk. But wine was an important part of it. It was actually cut two parts wine for three parts water. That's how it was cut. But there was still alcohol within it. And alcohol was, or the wine was a very important part of that celebration. And somebody said, well, Tom, I wouldn't have had it in mine. I'm sure God wouldn't have had it in his. But may I show you that even within God's own celebration, wine is an important thing? If you have your Bible, take a look at Isaiah, the 25th chapter. Isaiah 25, beginning with verse 6. And here God himself speaks through the prophet Isaiah and he says, at the end of time, there is going to be a celebration because death is going to be conquered and all things old are going to be made new. Listen to God's description of the party he's going to throw someday. And some of you might say, whoa, but this is God speaking through Isaiah. Isaiah 25, 6. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples. And you're going to say, hey, I can get into that. I've been to church potlucks. I like that good food. But look at where it goes from there. Along with the rich food for all peoples, a banquet of what? Aged wine. In other words, God's not going to bring out the cheap stuff. He's going to celebrate this great moment with what? with the vintage stuff and the best of meats. And what does it say again? The finest of wines. And on this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away all of the tears from all faces, and he will remove his people's disgrace from all of the earth, the Lord God has spoken. Do you see the importance of wine even within God's celebration? Wine was a part of saying not only, if you ever watched the old movie Fiddler on the Roof, to life, to life, lahayim. In other words,
cross as he's giving the care of Mary to John. And he says, woman, behold. This was a way of saying, I care for you. But mom, what do you want me to do here? Now I want you to take a look. Why did Mary do what she did here? Well, I think that Joseph had died many years earlier, and who was the oldest son of the family? Jesus. And in the way that the Middle Easterners and the Jews did it at the time, if dad's gone, who becomes dad? The oldest son. And so for years now, I believe every time Mary had a problem, she went to who? Jesus. And she didn't tell Jesus, Jesus, I want you to do it, and I want you to do it in this way. She simply went to Jesus and said, we have a problem, need you to take care of it. I'm not going to tell you how to do it. And that's what she did with Jesus here. Jesus gives her a little bit of, mom, what's this got to do with us? But then he comes back and mom says, I want you to do it. Take care of it. And so what does he do? He says to the servants, go fill up with water. 120 to 180 gallons, and then take it out and go, and we know it was the best of all wine. Not only did he give quantity, because no party needs 120 to 180 gallons of wine. God always answers our requests above what we could ever imagine. But he also answers our quest beyond the quality that we could imagine, and that's exactly what he did here. But let's get back to what I originally wanted you to do. What does this tell us about the personality of Jesus? Well, there's three things that I'd like you to consider, not about the miracles, but about Jesus. The first thing that I want you to take a look at is that Jesus accepted an invitation to a celebration. Jesus was not one of those people who said, No, I'm religious. I don't want to have fun. Jesus accepted a wedding invitation, and everybody knew that if you went to a celebration, a wedding, what would it be like? Good food. There would be lots of laughter. There would be just a celebration. People would get excited, and there would be dancing and singing. There would be all kinds of things. And you know what? I believe that if you had been there and looked in the courtyard, who would have been laughing the loudest? Who would have been dancing with gaiety and all of this? Jesus. Jesus is not a savior, a God who's afraid to laugh and have fun. He is a smiling savior. He is a savior who enjoys people and he likes to celebrate the good times with people. That's what you would have seen with Jesus here. But then you also take a look, and sometimes people will take a look at this and say, well, religious people shouldn't just enjoy themselves like that. But can I tell you why I believe Jesus was this way? Look at the condemnation Jesus received. If you have your Bible, look at Matthew, the 11th chapter, verse 19. Because they had been observing this guy for quite some time. And the Pharisees, they were the ones who always sat back with the pout on their face and they were criticizing how other people were doing things and you shouldn't act this way and you shouldn't let too much expression of display go this way. Matthew 11, 19, they accused Jesus, the son of man came eating and what? Drinking. But look at what they say after that. Look at the accusation. And they say he is a glutton. What does glutton mean? He eats too much. And they accused him of being a what? Drunkard, a wine bibber. Now, do I believe Jesus ever got drunk in his entire life? Absolutely not. But did Jesus enjoy a good time and a good celebration? And did he eat and did he drink? Absolutely he did. He was not a sad-faced sourpuss in the back of the room. He was somebody who enjoyed and took part in life. But then there's a second thing I hear, see here. Whose wedding was this? 
most scholars will tell you that this was not a rich boy's wedding. In fact, the reason they probably got in problem with the wine is they didn't have enough money to really buy as much wine as they needed. And so Jesus, the man who's trying to come and change the world with his words and his life, he's not rubbing shoulders with who? The rich and the powerful. He's a working class boy who was raised poor himself, whose daddy was poor himself, who knew what it meant to have hard labor, and he was not ashamed to hang around with people and to celebrate with people that others said that they're not in my class. That's the second thing I see about Jesus here. He remembers where he came from. And Jesus had a fondness for the poor, and he had a fondness for those people who life wasn't always very kind to. But then there's a third thing I see about Jesus. Not only was Jesus, I think probably, I don't mean this in a bad way, but the life of the party, people who drew others to, and he was not a snob. He had to hang around with certain people and drop names. Jesus was also a person who was always willing to help those who were in need, even if they couldn't help him back. In other words, Jesus was always there to help. They have no wine. And it would have been so easy for Jesus to say, not my problem. But is that how Jesus looked at this poor couple? It's their problem. They should plan better. When the need was presented to Jesus, what did he do? Jesus met the need. He met the need. And this need was so important because this family would have been crushed from there on. So as a person, what do we see about Jesus? He was a person who loved life. He was a person who enjoyed a good celebration. He's a person who knew how to laugh and he wasn't some dour-faced person who was always super serious. And he was also a person who enjoyed hanging around people who other people didn't always say, well, they really can't do anything for me, or they're not going to make me more popular around the community if I hang with them. Jesus loved to hang around with everybody. And no matter who you were, what your social station in life, if you had a need, you could lay it before Jesus and he could take care of it. Now, here's my question to you this morning. Do you have a need? Do you have a need? Do you have a need that, like a habit, you can't get rid of? No matter how hard you try, I can't get rid of this. Don't tell Jesus how he should handle it, but say, I've got this need. Lord, help me handle it. Do you have some forgiveness that you need to come your way. Lord, I have really messed up with my life. I, I, I've, I've said things, done things, and all of that. I need to be forgiven, and yet I can't find that forgiveness within myself. Jesus is there to help us with that need. Are you a person right now who has almost like demons who are haunting you that just won't let you free, won't let you go? You need to be released from them? Take that need to this man, Jesus. The man, Jesus, cares for you. He was fully God, but he was fully man also. How about depression? Are you going through depression in your life that you just can't seem to get free from? Bring it to Jesus. Do you have illness, whether it be yourself or somebody else, that you need help with that nobody seems to be able to find the answer to? Bring it to Jesus. It seems impossible just like it did there. Bring it to Jesus. Is your heart broken? Do you wish it could be mended? Do you have that need? Bring it to Jesus. Because here's the beautiful thing that I see about the man Jesus. He cares. He cares about people. He cares about the lowest. He cares about the highest. He cares about all. 
and he's approachable. He is totally approachable, and he has the authority to take care of our needs. Now, as we're going through this, take just a moment this morning and ask yourself the question. As you walk away from this wedding feast and you've watched Jesus, what do you think of him? What do you think of him? Is he not serious enough? He shouldn't have done this. He shouldn't have participated in that. God never, Jesus never sinned. When he laughed, it wasn't a sin. When he danced, it wasn't a sin. When he took a glass of wine, it wasn't for drunkenness, it wasn't a sin. He loved life and he celebrated life. He loved life and he celebrated life and he loved it with all people. It made me ask myself the question, if this Jesus is living in me, what should that make me? When people see me, do I look dour, unapproachable, without joy? That's not the Jesus who should be living in there. There should be joy and happiness. Do I pick out my friends from just the cream of the crop in the community so that I can pass names and say, I know that person and I was here or I was there? Or do I enjoy the company of those people, but I enjoy the company of people who other people omit and exclude? And the other question I ask, if Jesus is within me and there are people who have needs around me, Do I simply turn my eye and say, what's this to me? Or do I, like Jesus, say, wow, I can meet that need. Let me have a go at it because I love people. I don't use people. Step one in Jesus at this wedding. What was Jesus like as a person? Was he 100% God? He's 100% God, but what else is he? 100% human, and that human is somebody I would like to hang with. Bob, he might have even liked to have gone coyote hunting. I don't know. Bob's over there saying, I don't know, Tom, you're stretching that one. But the truth of the matter is, is that he liked to have a good time. He really did, and he loved all people, and he loved to make needs. Heavenly Father, this morning, the fact that he made the wine, that was great. But Father, I want to know Jesus. I want to know that man so that I can really understand who he is and how I can relate to him. Father, thank you that you do like to laugh, that you do like to celebrate that you do like to be an encourager to people. Thank you, Father, that you didn't come just to hang out with the royalty and the people at the high end of the religious spectrum, but you went down and felt just as comfortable, in fact, even more comfortable with those people who didn't have a lot. And thank you, Father, that you are one who meets needs because you love people and you want to take care of those who call upon your name. This morning, Father, if there is somebody who has never seen Jesus and is not close to them, let them recognize what you have done for them on the cross and let them take care of the biggest need. But Father, for those of us who are Christians, I pray that we would begin to show more of the real Jesus through us And that people would say, hey, you are different, and you're different than I thought Christians were supposed to be in the best possible way. Be with us this morning. If there's a need here this morning, may they come forward in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? And if you're...
Please be seated. So you want us to go ahead and uh, do a couple more? Yep. Okay, all right. Praise God. Well, then, can you stand up with us and join <laughs> it and as we sing of his power and his precious blood? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, one working power. being with us. Next Sunday we're going to travel with Jesus to the other end of the group event. We're at a wedding today. We're going to be at a funeral next week. And we're going to watch how Jesus ministers to two sisters who have lost a brother. And you're going to find out that Jesus tailors his ministry to who we are and where we're at rather than one particular way that fits all. He looks at us as individuals and he loves us as individuals. I hope you'll come back and see how Jesus the man relates to those whom he loves. Heavenly Father, be with us as we go this week. Let us take the joy of Jesus. Let us take his presence with us and let us minister to all if we have been ministered to ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in God's grace, go in his peace.